Welcome to this overview of this year's challenge. Um, I'm Helmut Simonis. Uh, this is joint work with Jim Freuder. We're both from the Insight Center for Data Analytics at uh, University College Cork in Ireland. Okay, what we are going to explain in this uh, presentation is the rationale behind the, the challenge. So this is about constraint acquisition and we explain why we are picking this particular version of uh, the problem for our challenge. And we discuss the generation of instances and the scoring <clears throat> and look at some properties of the instances that are um, prepared. And uh, uh, then we'll have an overview of lessons learned and some open questions that need answers if we want to progress. Okay, so what's this all about? Uh, well, we want to build an automated modeler that can model a variety of combinatorial problems uh, from positive and negative examples. And the examples are taken from CSP lib, uh, the literature and some training courses on CP. So these are standard kind of problems that you would encounter when you learn about constraint programming. And what we want to do is we want to be able to automatically uh, create a model from these positive and negative examples. So the user doesn't have to write the model of the problem anymore. Um, a second objective is to provide a common test set for evaluating constraint acquisition tools. Um, that is a challenge uh, um, that so far basically every paper had its own kind of problem and its own approach and it was very difficult to compare uh, these uh, different results. And uh, this is only a first step, but this should be developed further and obviously we are looking for people who are interested in helping with that. So what's constraint acquisition? If you don't know that, uh, um, we want to learn constraint models from data and there are basically two approaches to uh, this whole thing. One is you are given positive and negative examples and from that you should deduce the model. And that's what's called passive learning. And the alternative is what is called active learning. You can ask questions uh, to a user and the user will answer um, whether, yes, this is a solution, this is not a solution, until uh, you are sure that you have the right model. Okay, this is useful as constraint acquisition in general. This is useful to uh, understand the problem. Um, you may not really know much about constraint programming and uh, about modeling of combinatorial problems. So this might be helpful in order to understand which particular problem we are solving. Um, you can then use the model that you generate to classify new examples as solutions or non-solutions. And that is useful in a variety of instances, but even more, um, you could use the generated model to find new solutions, perhaps uh, to the same problems that you were seeing before or to new problems that you haven't seen before, but which are of the same type. And obviously that would be uh, very much uh, in the direction of the Holy Grail. Um, so you're not even programming anymore. You're just providing examples and uh, both the modeling and the solving is done automatically by a system. Okay, here's an example where we have a Sudoku problem and we would start with uh, um, some examples. So here we are seeing uh, a 4x4 four four Sudoku and a 9x9 nine nine Sudoku. Here we're seeing a positive example in blue um, and a negative example uh, in red. And we have examples, <coughs> more than one, um, in these different sizes. And then we pass this to our constraint acquisition tool and uh, it could come up with a model. And the model for Sudoku could be um, each, for each row of a matrix, we have an all different constraint. For each column of a matrix, we have an all different constraint. And for each block, we have an all different constraint. Now, this is not the only model. There are many other ways of expressing um, the, the problem, but this is a very concise way of uh, expressing things. And you could then take this model in the appropriate form, pass it uh, through a solver and produce a solution like so. Uh, here we have a 16 by 16. Um, problem and that would be uh, very nice if we can learn from smaller instances and then solve larger instances. <clears throat> we can also use the um, acquired model to classify some tests and here we are seeing uh, some tests in different sizes and uh, we are classifying this as a solution and these two as non-solutions and uh, um, that would be basically um, the, 
last use of, of uh, this generated model. Um, so we can use it as a classifier, as a predictor, um, whether something is a solution or not. Now, if we're really good, then we can generate uh, runnable code. Uh, uh, this, for example, is a Sudoku model in Minisync, which is generated by uh, my own uh, constraint acquisition tool. Um, and you see, well, we have some parameter here, the size, we have uh, variables, we have constraints, and we have an objective. And this is basically built from the examples that are given. And we'll come back to this problem uh, in, uh, in the later part of the talk. It's not quite as simple as that. Um, but uh, this would be good if we basically have a program that also a user can understand and interact with. And then ideally, we could also have a textual description of the problem. And here we have a uh, um, description of the Sudoku puzzle generated by a cut. Uh, and uh, well, you can see there is some text there, which is all template based. This is not really clever natural language processing, but uh, it is a readable, understandable description of the problem. And again, that is useful um, to give to a user because he can then say, yes, I understand this constraint. I don't understand this constraint. And I don't think that this constraint really is part of the problem. And this would allow you to interact more closely with the user and help the user to really define uh, what the problem is uh, based on their own understanding. Okay, a little bit of background. I'm involved in the Assistant project. Uh, this is an um, EU project in the ICT38 group um, where constraint acquisition is part of uh, Work Package 4, which is about scheduling and production planning. And what we want to achieve there is we want to make constraint acquisition relevant in a real-world scheduling environment. And we are basing this on some case studies we get from Siemens Energy and Atlas Copco. Um, so real production manufacturing environments, and uh, they actually provide us data um, from which we can try and learn uh, things. But this is a bit too complicated uh, for um, this first step of a challenge. So we have a few simpler problems there. So the intended use case in the system is that we have our input data uh, which consists of the actual parameter, the input data um, that give us, that describe, for example, the factory and the orders. Um, we are given a set of solutions and a set of non-solutions, and these can be of multiple sizes because uh, um, the order set, for example, changes every day. We give this to the constraint acquisition and it produces a generic model. Um, so this is size independent, um, and we can take that model together with unseen input data uh, run it through a solver and produce a solution, let's say for tomorrow's schedule, um, with orders that only arrive today and that we haven't seen before. So ideally we want to automate this uh, end to end. Uh, the user can interact with the constraint acquisition tool and change parameters there, change settings, um, but also we can modify and perhaps extend the generic model. Um, we are not planning that this is fully automated, uh, but something that uh, does a lot of the routine work for the user. So we want to actually demonstrate this end-to-end -to -end tool chain and uh, um, basically show that this is feasible for an uh, industrial environment. So some properties, the generated model must be transferable to new data, and in particular, it must deal with uh, problem sizes that vary from day to day. And uh, we also have that some of the variables of the model may not be exposed in the solution because the user is not interested in them. For example, individual cost variables, they may not be actually written down. They may also only be the aggregate cost value. Um, and in, another important aspect is that the constraints are there for a reason. And there are basically two reasons that can be due to the structure of the problem, like uh, in the Sudoku um, problem, where uh, things were based on the rows, columns, and blocks, and didn't depend really on any input data. Um, or it could be due to input data where um, we are giving input data and only build the model based on that data. Uh, think of graph coloring where um, we basically are given a graph to color and uh, without that graph to color, we don't really know which problem we want to solve. So these are things that are important uh, um, that our constraint acquisition approach should be able to deal with. Um, but Doing all this automatically is probably too much of a holy grail um, as a first-year challenge. 
Um, so what we want to be able with this challenge is to show some progress towards uh, the overall goal and to also allow some intermediate solutions. So you can also participate if you can only generate instance specific models and if you have ability to predict the outcome for specific sizes, for known sizes. Um, of course, you can answer more questions if you can predict the outcome for unseen sizes and even more uh, if you are able to run your model and generate new solutions for given or unseen sizes, uh, that would be uh, very good. And we are starting with some simpler problems. We are not actually trying to solve everything uh, in one go or start, start with a really complicated scheduling problem. Um, we are starting with uh, simpler puzzles. So this is how the challenge overall works. We have a data set generator which produces uh, multiple instances uh, of different sizes with input data, um, a solution template, I'll talk about that in the, in the next slide, uh, the solutions and non-solutions and some tests that you have to answer. And we can take uh, this data and run it through a checker which is part of the data set generator um, to provide the intended classification. So this is whether some test should be a solution or a non-solution is based on what our model uh, in our data set generator actually said it should do. And then the user basically has uh, his acquisition tool and it produces a test classification result that we can compare against the intended classification, evaluate and provide a score. And the user may also provide extra solutions to the problem that we haven't seen before. And we pass that through a checker to see that there actually really are solutions. And uh, if you are correct, uh, that gives you some extra values. So that's very good. Okay, here is an example of some input data. In, this is in JSON. And uh, we have a specific problem type. Uh, and we have 15 of these problem types in our first data set. Um, the instance number here, we have a few instances, 10 up to 20, I think, uh, for uh, the different problem types. Um, there is a size parameter, which in this particular case is all we really uh, need to know about the size of the problem. We have a format template, which shows us that, uh, um, well, the result is a, is a list, uh, and each of the lists is a domain variable, which ranges from 1 to 7. Um, and then we have a solution list, uh, which again um, has individual solutions given as lists, um, just as a list of integer values. The non-solutions are also given as uh, such an array of, of solutions. And then we have the tests, which are um, the questions that you should answer. And this is the part for one instance. We may have multiple instances per problem type, and then we have multiple problem types. So we have a slightly larger uh, JSON file um, for each problem type uh, that describes uh, the overall input data. And then the user should produce a, a result uh, where we identify the user here, and we are saying for type number one um, problem, instance number one, um, the tests actually evaluate like this. So we are saying it's a solution, it's a non-solution, and so on. And if you want to give extra solution, then you basically give uh, uh, some extra solution uh, for this problem number one, we actually have a list of integers and uh, an integer value, which is the objective that we try to achieve. Um, and so this is the JSON format in which the results are uh, um, given to uh, the evaluation. And then we basically look at, uh, is this um, a right, the, the correct prediction um, and how many of these you've got right and, and how many are wrong and try to evaluate that. Uh, so a correct classification obviously scores a positive value, the incorrect classification scores a negative value, and then we normalize the score uh, so that if you do everything correctly for every possible instance, you get a score of 100. If you only answer questions about uh, uh, known problem sizes, you're getting a 67 um, score as a maximum that you can achieve. And then you can get extra points if you have the extra solutions, uh, up to 100 solutions per instance, um, but taking into account that not all problem instances have extra solutions. So your final score could well be above 100 if you have a lot of these extra, extra solutions. Okay, now a bit more technical detail. How does this all work? Well, okay, this is uh, how the dataset generator operates. Uh, let's have a closer look here. 
Uh, the important thing is that we have uh, three elements which are specific to each problem type. We have the instance generator, we have uh, a model, and we have a checker for um, the, uh, the problem. So these three things are done by hand. And then we run the instance generator to provide input data um, and also to generate the solution template, um, take the input data with the model, run it through a solver, and this gives us a set of non-solutions. And we can now take the non-solutions, pass it through a modifier, which changes some of the values in the assignment, and give that to the checker. And normally this will, well, most likely this will be a non-solution, so we store it there. If we're lucky, we find another solution, and we put it back there. And we can also try and take the solution template and just do a random assignment and check it. And that would give us more known and more non-solutions. Non um, so if we have done that for a while, um, we can run this through our test selector, which will select a subset of the solutions as the selected solutions that are shown to the user. Um, a selected set of the non-solutions are shown um, to uh, um, the user as well. And then we have a selected set of tests, which are there uh, to test what the system, um, what the user basically is producing. So um, this is how the, the whole structure actually operates. Now, uh, in phase two, we could also have differential models where um, instead of just having the original model, um, you produce a model that uh, helps you um, to find solutions that are close to the original, but which violate some of the constraints of uh, the original model. And that would produce no non-solutions in addition to our other um, modifications and checks uh, um, that uh, we could then use to differentiate uh, the results more clearly. Okay, so some of the properties, uh, properties of the challenge problems, and I should say a spoiler alert, if you don't want to know what these things are because you want to actually participate yourself, you should uh, not listen to this uh, uh, for the next minute. Okay, here we have uh, the problems of our first set. And you see um, these are numbered from one to 16. Number nine is missing. It's reserved for a problem um, that I couldn't finish in time. And it ranges from things like craft coloring and queens to warehouse location and orthogonal Latin squares and um, balanced block uh, designs, Costa's array. Um, a lot of those problems are well known in the area. And I have listed here the CSP lib number for some of the problems. Some of these things also like craft coloring was also already in Laurier's uh, Alice uh, and it was one of our first examples in CHIP. Uh, uh, so these are well-known, well-respected uh, kind of problems. Sudoku, um, we have two variants here with some pre-assignment and without pre-assignment. Um, the oldest problem is probably problem number 11 from uh, um, Euler. Uh, so this is 18th century about uh, orthogonal Latin squares. And we have some variants of the end queens problem um, with some fairy chess pieces um, just to see whether um, your solver does only really recognize the queens in the, in the puzzle or can actually deal with some, some more complicated uh, uh, items. And here we're listing some of the features uh, of these problems. And yeah, so some of these things have input data like the warehouse location. There's a cost matrix and a cost vector as input data. There are some implicit variables. For the Gollum ruler, we have some implicit decision variables and it's an optimization problem um, and so on. So each of these things is chosen uh, not only because it's a well-known uh, problem, but also because it exposes a particular feature um, that we want to be able to deal with uh, in constraint acquisition. Okay, so now some of the lessons learned. Okay, doing this, uh, um, I was surprised to see how quickly you can get uh, quite a reasonable classification just by learning about all different constraints. And uh, um, in some prob problems, it is enough to just learn a single all different constraint. Um, and we'll see that uh, later on in the presentation of results uh, um, that uh, this can be actually quite good already. Um, now, of course, you can argue that this may be due to the simplicity of the problems in the data set. 
and also because we are not really doing very complicated non-solution generation. Um, we basically randomly modify solutions or create random assignments and uh, they may have very well different properties uh, from the solutions that are easy to detect. Um, what is important here is that even if you have a solution with 100% uh, prediction accuracy, um, the model that you are producing may not be able to produce any correct extra solutions. And uh, that is uh, important to understand. Um, the prediction accuracy, the classification accuracy, is not really uh, a very good uh, indicator of uh, the quality of the results. So um, if it's enough if you miss one constraint of the intended model, um, that uh, your solutions that you're producing basically violate that constraint, uh, so they fail the checker, um, and uh, you produce solutions that are not correct, uh, um, but you never saw an, an example in the negative examples that would expose that problem. And uh, um, this is a bit unfair, but uh, I think this is to be expected. And of course, it's possible that you can generate a model and you can run it, but you don't find solutions because uh, you have too many constraints, uh, not all relevant, um, or you don't have the right search strategy. And uh, obviously that can happen as well. Um, so in order to really do this uh, uh, more seriously, we need more diverse examples to actually see how good are we really at uh, solving problems that we don't know already. Um, and. Uh, um, that are not uh, standard examples. Uh, so it's very likely that uh, um, we would overfit at the moment uh, the models to uh, the examples and, and the non-solutions that uh, are given. And we have a, an overall question of uh, what do we really want to find in uh, our approach? Um, so uh, if we see this as a kind of Venn diagram. We are starting with the set of, of all possible um, uh, constraints and uh, um, this is the chosen bias and obviously this may be a subset of all possible constraints that one can express. Uh, and then we are rejecting, um, and this is in red here, uh, a large number of constraints because they actually would uh, um, violate the positive examples and therefore um, they if the constraint holds, uh, this would no longer be a positive example. Um, then we are getting the accepted solutions in light blue here. These are all the constraints that are compatible with the positive examples. And then we have the useful constraints in this darker blue. These are all the constraints that reject at least one of the negative examples. And then we could look at what is the minimum set of constraints that we need to reject all negative examples. And uh, um, we see that there is more than one minimal set, and uh, um, there could be very many of those. And then there may well be um, a kernel here, which is the required constraints. So the constraints that we have to have in our model to reject some of the negative examples that are not rejected by anything else. Um, whether that exists or not will depend on the bias and and uh, the constraints that we are investigating. So perhaps a, a slight example here. Um, this is the Sudoku puzzle. These are all the constraints that are accepted. Uh, and the selected model is in green. Um, let's focus a, a little bit on, on this. Um, so the selected model basically consists of three permutation constraints for the rows, the columns, and the blocks. And they are chosen here because, well, they are actually seen as highly significant um, and uh, they are accepted, but we also have uh, um, three or different constraints which we could use, uh, and they are only slightly less uh, relevant, but they are subsumed by um, the permutation constraints. And we have things like a lex all different constraint and the all different except zero. Um, and then we have things like the sum of each row um, evaluates to a constant uh, which we actually find um, CF2 is a formula that is uh, generated um, and uh, that's a property um, that also the sum of all columns and the sum of all blocks uh, evaluates to that. Well, it's easy to see why this happens. It's because the permutation basically has the numbers from 1 to n and uh, we see in each row just uh, all those numbers and they sum up uh, to a particular formula. 
And then we have some other constraints that uh, might actually work. So we can see that uh, um, just finding all accepted constraints is not really enough. We may have to look at uh, uh, some of the things that are subsumed uh, and that we want to uh, take out. Um, but we also uh, have to make sure that uh, um, we are not keeping in some constraints um, like uh, um, the not all equal um, that uh, um, we could express on, on um, all the variables, which basically don't do anything. Uh, they don't reject any of, of the negative examples and um, they should not be included in the model. Okay, next point, what coverage is required? Um, well, we don't really know that much about the negative examples. Well, we know that all the positive examples are solutions of the problem, um, but we don't know where the negative examples come from. They may be things that uh, a user has rejected, or they may be things where we have run with a subset of the constraints to see whether we can solve the problem faster. Um, but uh, um, we don't know whether they actually expose particular constraints, uh, uh, make sure that particular constraints are in our model. Um, we could, for the challenge, um, include differentiating examples. So we take our model, we change it by negating one of the constraints and solve it. If you find a solution, that's a non-solution of the original model because you have actually um, changed one constraint to its negative. Um, but uh, this may be quite difficult to solve um, because the negation of the global constraints are not always global constraints uh, and uh, is maybe actually quite difficult to write down. And obviously, if you do this for every constraint in your model, this may be very tedious to do by hand. Um, so you would be looking for some automation to do this. Um, but if we do this uh, differentiating models um, systematically, we would find very, very good negative examples. And they would reduce basically the set of constraints that we should be considering. Um, so and this might be helpful, but it's not particularly realistic in the real world case. In the real world case, you don't have a model that you can uh, modify by negating one of the constraints. Doing all this uh, assumes that you know already an awful lot about your model and about the problem um, and that you're able to solve these uh, uh, modified uh, models as well. Um, so it's not quite clear whether this is actually fair uh, in, a, in a realistic setting uh, to expect the non-solutions uh, to have these kind of coverage. How many samples uh, do we need? That's another question. Um, we typically have very few positive examples um, because, let's say, in a scheduling problem, we would have one per day of scheduling. Um, but we could have many instances. We would have uh, one for each day of a year if we have uh, data going back. And we can produce a lot of negative examples with just a random generator, but um, good negative examples may be even more rare than the positive examples. So how many do we actually uh, have? Uh, in our uh, run here, we, ha we have uh, um, given a lot of examples because we know that some methods actually require um, a lot of samples to work. So we didn't want to um, exclude those techniques uh, a priori. And what do we do with optimization problems? That's a valid question as well. Um, but okay, that's perhaps for the discussion later on and for the extension. And the same for active constraint acquisition. <clears throat> so something where you can ask the system questions. Um, we can do something like this because we have a checker uh, that could answer these questions. Um, but we then would have to modify the whole infrastructure and the interaction of uh, the system. And that would be difficult. And then more fundamentally, is this the correct use case? Um, a lot of papers look at a different scenario where you want to discover the structure of one specific constraint instance and which constraints uh, um, hold over which subset of the variables and asking a lot of questions about that problem. And uh, this is in, in quite a few papers, uh, um, but I personally can't see a practical use case uh, linked to this. But again, that might be open for discussion. Summary. Okay, we have presented the initial challenge for the progress towards the holy grail uh, of CP21. Uh, it's based on a realistic use case uh, and it tries to find generic transferable models from 
sample positive and negative uh, examples. Um, you can solve something simpler uh, if your tool basically does not uh, carry the whole use case. And there are a number of open questions um, that we uh, want to discuss. We have a uh, presentation of results in a live session later on. And uh, we'll also talk about continuing the challenge with uh, an updated version of uh, the problem. The material of this challenge is available on Synodo um, and you have an extended data set um, that's planned after the workshop. It will be stored in the same location. Okay, so this was the overview and we're running a little bit over time. Um, so questions and, and discussion will be in the live session later on.